and a wife, not to be an academic. But they wanted her to be uh, the debutante, so she went through with the ball, she was presented before Queen, and then went to Oxford, where she studied the PPE program, which was politics, philosophy, and economics. She was a middling student. She was thought to be bright, but she didn't uh, perform great. She didn't perform poorly. But when she was done um, at Oxford, well, actually, while she was at Oxford, she was still the daughter of a rich person, and she lived that life. She was no counterculture person at this point. But there was one thing she did that was really interesting. The Oxford Union at her time was still only allowing men into the building. So Rose dressed as a man and, with one of her friends and uh, broke the rules and went in. Nobody noticed her uh, when she went in and she posed as a man and then let the world know that a woman had gone into the Oxford Union. So this was a big to-do for her. You could see she's being photographed, prepping herself to go in as a man. That's her on the left with the glasses on. So it was really a bold thing at the time. You know, if in a current day, that would be the sort of thing, it made the newspapers, and that would be the sort of thing you'd probably see on a, on a, in, in our 24 hour news cycle, that this rich woman had broken the rules and, and uh, broke the glass ceiling in the Oxford Union. After she graduated from Oxford, she went to get a master's degree. And I have always contended that all major art theft always has a tie to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And in this story, she came for her master's degree to Mount Holyoke. And uh, really an impressive thing. She comes to Mount Holyoke. I, they were incredibly helpful to me in, in, they had a big file on her. It was a real testament to their archives department that they kept tabs on her because it was uh, years after she left that she hit headlines. Um, so she comes to the United States. And it's interesting even in that respect, because if you ask Rose Dugdale today, she's 80 years old, what her least favorite country in the world would be, it would probably be the United States uh, because of politics and capitalism. But back then you can see she bought into the whole thing. So she comes across the pond, she's dressed in American clothes with the cowboy boots and the hat and a flannel shirt. And the car she's sitting on is this little sports car that she had shipped over from England. So she's hardly a, you know, a commoner at this point. And in fact, during the winter break, she took the car and sped across the country on her own. So she was bold and interesting. And as I tell this story, um, I hope you I hope you try to keep the frame of reference that she's doing this in the 50s and 60s. Uh, these are these are things that most people didn't do back then, but she was doing them. After she graduated from uh, Mount Holyoke, she then went back to England, went to Bedford College, and she got her PhD there, again in philosophy and economics, and uh, really studied the most arcane type um, philosophical thought. She was a, a I guess she was a, um, a vigorous student. She didn't shy away from challenges. She took on the hard work. And then she went to work for the UN for a while in uh, Great Britain. But then she became an academic, so she was teaching um, in uh, her home country. This is a, uh, her passport photo, and I show you these pictures because I want you to see the progression of this young woman. Uh, I think you would agree she was an attractive young lady, um, and I'm using these terms. I hope they're not offending anybody, but I'm using them because of what the newspaper described her as. And um, she, something really important happens. I have to remember it's the 1960s, and uh, in the mid 60s to the late 60s, she's an academic and she's on campuses and she's with people that are about five or six younger, five or six years younger than her. But when you're 28 years old, there's a big difference between you and a 22 year old college student. Uh, but she's really taken part in the sit-ins that are starting to happen. And in 1968, most of you um, know, was an incredibly um, eventful year around the world, not just in the United States. I mean, of course, in the US, you had the protest at the conventions, you had two incredible assassinations. Even today, it's still hard to imagine two major figures like RFK and MLK being assassinated within two months of each other. Um, there were revolutions around the world, sit-ins and protests in, in the UK. And in 68, Castro decides he's going to have what's called a Cinco de Mayo camp he's going to invite um, the intelligentsia of students to Cuba to come see his revolution. And he, uh, amongst these invitations is Rose Dugdale, even though she's no longer a student, she's a professor. 
but she uh, decides she's going to go with these people that are a lot younger than her. I don't have a photo of her there, but to give you a, a sense of who was there, on the right, you could see um, it's one of my favorite authors, Christopher Hitchens. And he, he went to the Cinco de Mayo camps and he wrote about them. Well, in fact, right now I'm rereading his autobiography and I'm, I'm on that part when he's in Cuba. A lot of the students um, were wise to Castro. They found his two hour lectures every day boring. They uh, were not impressed with a lot of what they saw. They saw a lot of authoritarianism around them, but not Rose. Rose loved what she saw. She took to the people, she took to the work that they had them doing in the fields, and she was engaged by Castro's very long uh, speeches and the oppressive heat. Uh, perhaps it was because she was a bit more mature, I don't know, but this was an important event for Rose. So it's 1968, she has caught the bug, and even though she was still, uh, had before this trip, had still uh, benefited from the excesses of her parents' wealth and they would send her money constantly. She returns home to the UK with a revolutionary spirit that she hadn't shown before, aside from some sit-ins and, and such. And what she does is she comes home and she goes to her, she sells her apartment in Chelsea and she establishes a storefront. And uh, what they had in Britain at the time were places called tenants unions. And she went to Tottenham, which is a working class area, and she establishes this storefront as the Tottenham Tenants Union, and later called it the Civil Rights Union. And from this storefront, she begins her journey as what we would now call a social justice warrior. But I think that's too tame an expression. Sometimes I refer to her as a social justice Navy SEAL. I mean, she was very much into her work. The type of things she would do there would be suppose you were a, a single mother and you uh, were evicted, she would help you get an apartment, even if it meant having you squat in an apartment that didn't, didn't belong to you. If you were on the dole and you questioned how much money you were getting or they were holding your money, she would go with you to the government offices and she was the bane of the civil servant. She would go in and slap the tables or turn them over on people and really fight for her her clients. This was a charity work. And again, she had sold her apartment, so she had a lot of money and her father was still sending her money. Um, so she was able to survive. Now, she was still an activist. And at this time, she would uh, partake in a lot of union strikes. And at one union strike, it was an interesting one too. It was this, again, this was a different time. What had happened was the union, um, you know, this book, as an aside, this book, the thread throughout it is feminine heroes and anti-heroes. It's a feminist book. So she fights on behalf of women who's, who are not getting, who's, the union was not giving wives and mothers their husband's benefits when they got in trouble or went to jail. So they picketed about this. And at one of these rallies, she meets a man named Walter Heaton. And Walter Heaton is himself a revolutionary. He's about uh, 13 years older than Rose, 13 or 14 years older. He's very dynamic. He's a leader of men. He's tall and handsome. And he and Rose become, I say, like Velcro. They're so connected to each other. You never see one without the other. They're in every protest. Uh, they're, they're out at night at pubs getting in fights and, and getting locked up for the night. They're getting arrested at, um, for minor things at... Uh, at rallies, but Wally has a criminal record already. Um, so there, this is an interesting aside. Walter is the love of her life at the time. And uh, the problem is Walter is married and living with his wife and his children. And it's an era of free love and Rose thinks nothing of carrying on her affair with Walter right under his wife's nose, right in the marital bed. She would be there every night they would speak in broken Gaelic to each other, and poor Mrs. Heaton would be treated like an outcast. Um, when you read her story, it's very sad, actually. But Rose must have felt some guilt because she took her wealth and she was giving it to people in the area. She gave Walter and his wife about 20,000 pounds, which is a real enormous amount of money, in 1974 especially. And she was outfitting Walter in the finest suits and he was driving a Mercedes. So here's this socialist revolutionary who is living the high life on his 
paramours largesse that she was getting from her dad. It was really a strange social situation during this turbulent time. Now, of significance, I would point out what you can't miss in that picture is the Irish tricolor above her office. They put this up later. And what I find really interesting about this is that Rose's incredibly momentous life is shaped by a confluence of unbelievable events that happen uh, simultaneous to her emergence. And one of them is in 1969, when she comes back from Cuba, is the rebirth of Irish republicanism in Northern Ireland. And the Irish people are rising again. The IRA is rising again in 1969. And um, however, this time they're taking on, uh, for, for the most part, they're taking on Martin Luther King's approach of, non, of, of peaceful um, demonstration and uh, nonviolent resistance. And they're conducting marches and such. And Rose takes to this like a, uh, like a natural. And she and Walter, soon enough, are demonstrating on behalf of Irish rights. They put up the Irish flag, as I showed you, in front of their storefront, which must have been startling for people in Great Britain at the time. And um, I love this picture. You can see they're being interviewed by the press because of their activism. And you can see the way Walter's looking at Rose. This is why I love this photo. This is at their office, and he's in his fine pinstripe suit that she bought him. And um, you, you can just see how, how um, uh, taken by her he is. Now, as Rose gets into trouble for years in her life, the media tries to analyze this because she's this PhD from Oxford. And why is she engaged in these activities and giving away her money? And the press and columnists would opine that she fell under the influence of Walter Heaton because it's 1974 and the woman must have been under the influence of a man. She couldn't possibly be this independent spirit. I had the opportunity to interview Walter for this book and he attests to what my suspicion was. He was completely under her spell. Things he was doing were because she captivated him, not the other way around. And I think this photograph really sums it up well. So because she's giving away her money and Walter enjoys the high life and um, they need to survive, they, uh, they run out of their money because they, they just spent so much. So where would she get more? And they turn to the one source that they had always turned to for money, her father. And one holiday weekend when the, her family had left the family farm in Devon, um, they went to the Epsom Derby, which is like our Kentucky Derby. She and Walter and another uh, uh, compatriot broke into the family home on the farm, and they stole her father's paintings and his antiques. And um, the stuff was not uh, the masterworks, like we'll see later. However, they're very valuable. The, the amount that she took was estimated to be about 125,000 pounds worth of um, of art and antiques, it's a lot of money. And, but so they had a good idea, a, a dastardly good idea, but they're not good criminals and they're caught right away. And the reason they're caught is because uh, they, they don't, Rose is not a thief. She doesn't, you know, this is new to her. So the clues that led the police to her included the fact that none of the dogs on the farm barked, none of the servants heard any of the, the animals being rustled because they all loved Rose, the dogs. And when they investigated the crime scene, they found that every room in the house had been pilfered except her bedroom. And the one valuable antique that was left behind was this beautiful little piece that she had given her mother. So they knew right away it was Rose. She was arrested quickly. And here's another really illustrative part. The, the looks on their faces are always so telling. This is the pair of them after they've been arrested. And you can see Walter knows what awaits him. He's an ex-con. They've been arrested for breaking and entering and, and stealing. But look at Rose. She's thrilled by this prospect. She wants to, she, she needs to establish her bona fides. Everybody she socializes with, including Wally, are true blue, lower class, working class um, uh, people who came from nothing and are fighting the real fight. And here's this Oxford PhD aristocrat. And one great way for her to make her bones would be a jail um, term. And you can see she's, she's taken by this whole affair. And 
the courtroom scene is amazing. So in, in this book, you'll see again in the 70s, it was a different time. And in Britain, the wheels of justice moved quickly. So they went to court. They were both easily found guilty. But what Rose did, and Wally to some extent, was use the courtroom as their bully pulpit. So they had the opportunity to speak in front of the press and, and in front of admirers and in front of their families um, because this was worldwide news again this, about this aristocrat. And uh, Walter gets up and he's sentenced to six years. And to show you the sense of ego that Walter had at the time, and he's a wonderful guy, I speak to him now, he's just such a lovable guy, but he, he said, not since the time, not since Christ has there been a greater travesty of justice. And you can just see, you know, Walter was arrested for stealing some art and antiques. It's hardly Christ-like. Um, Rose gets up and really gives a, a, a fierce, memorable political speech. And her father, her poor and battled parents are there by her side at every moment. And she looks to her father and says, I love you, daddy, but I hate everything you stand for. And their parents just don't understand where they, where they went wrong with their, their beloved Rose. The judge turns to her for her sentence. And he says, she's responsible for her actions. Um, however, he believes, the judge believes, that she fell under the influence of this Walter Heaton, and essentially based on her upbringing, he says, because I believe you are incredibly unlikely to offend again, he suspends her sentence and she goes free. It's one of the greatest mis misjudgments in the history of the judiciary. Um, she's allowed to go free. She sees it as a travesty. This is pure class justice, she says and she's allowed to go free. And when she's outside and the cameras are there, you can see she doesn't shy away from them. She, she raises her fist defiantly and uh, it enjoys, it seems, the attention that she gets. Now, Walter's in jail. This inseparable pair is now separated for years, and she pledges her loyalty to him. She goes to see him every week in jail. She... Um, she does what she can to try to get opportunities to see him in court. And when you, when you read the book, hopefully, uh, you'll see some of the shenanigans that she pulled to, to, to get to see him. She would protest on his behalf, free Wally Heaton, the people's best friend, her sign would read. And uh, to the authorities, your fear is greater than ours. Now, frankly, I don't know what the heck that has to do with her breaking into her parents' home, but this is her thing. She is a revolutionary. And she is ascribing to this notion that was taking rise at the time of direct action. And direct action is an interesting thing to me, especially given, given the activism that we see nowadays. And when I speak to college students and such about this book, I explain the difference between protesters and direct action it would nowadays be a protester would be someone on Twitter complaining constantly, but the direct action person is the person that's in the streets of Seattle or Minnesota or at the Capitol. You know, it's not necessarily a good thing, but direct action means you're going to do whatever it takes to get your goal, however ugly it might be. So I'm painting this picture of Rose being dedicated to Wally, but interestingly, it only lasts for a matter of weeks. And despite her, her pledges of, of fidelity to him, she soon disappears right after Christmas, without warning to Walter at all, without any indication to him that she was going. She leaves and never speaks to him again, just disappears. And she goes across the sea to Ireland. When she gets to Ireland, she is a, uh, I hate to say new and improved, she is a vastly more, uh, aggressive Rose Dugdale. And one of, the, one of the things that happens is as, she, as soon as she goes over, she meets up with a new man. So no sooner is Walter out of the picture, only because he went to jail, than she takes up with the guy in uh, Ireland named Eddie Gallagher. Now, Eddie, unlike Walter, is much younger than Rose. And Eddie is a true blue IRA man. He's born in Ireland, he believes in the cause, However, he's so rogue and so um, brash that he has his own special active unit. Um, 
the IRA, and I, in the book, I leave it for the reader to decide whether the IRA, what side of this, if any, they're on, whether they think someone's a terrorist or a freedom fighter, that's for the reader to decide. But the one thing that's undeniable, despite what you think of what they did, the IRA acted strategically. And what they did, they did with a mission and uh, contemplation. Eddie had no time for such things. Eddie was, like Rose, a direct action person. There's no time for discussion. We need to make things better. So no sooner is Rose in Ireland than she goes to a helicopter rental uh, company and she meets the captain at a bar and she tells him she's a journalist and she'd like to fly over certain parts of Northern Ireland to, um, to, for a story she's writing. And they agree on a price. And a couple of days later, she returns. And um, when she greets the captain, here come two guys, I'm sorry, three guys, including Eddie, uh, with guns and with milk churns. They're carrying these big milk churns. And what are the milk churns filled with but explosives? dozens and dozens of pounds of explosives, it, it, which is a, a real uh, deadly amount. They packed these themselves. Rose was right there making these bombs. And the plan is they're going to hijack this heli helicopter and they made the pilot at gunpoint fly where they directed. The bombs were so heavy, two had to be left behind because they were too heavy for the helicopter. So they direct the pilot with a gun to his head to fly to a part of Northern Ireland called Straban. And in uh, Straban at the time was one of, if not the most bombed places in Northern Ireland during the Troubles. Because it's now it's 1973 and um, Bloody Sunday has already happened and all kinds of violence has happened and innocent people have been killed on both sides. But um, members of the military, the, uh, the paratroopers from the British army have killed marchers, peaceful marchers on Bloody Sunday and it's time it's time for violence. So they, they order this captain to fly to Straban and they order him, him to hover over a police constabulary. And it's the Royal Ulster Police. And the plan is to drop these large bombs onto these police barracks. And when they do, um, the bombs, one bomb falls harmlessly into the water and another falls on the rocks and something was wrong with the fuse and it didn't detonate. So nobody's harmed. Um, however, this is the first aerial assault on British territory since World War II. It's the first such terrorist attack, if you can call it terrorism, um, to happen. And this is a major, major deal. So when the, when the media interviews the police commanders from that barracks, he gives this interview where he says, we stood and we watched them used as these bombs fell helplessly. And they kind of portrayed them as like Laurel and Hardy sort of uh, bumbling crew of terrorists. But make no mistake, what Rose had attempted with his bombing was nothing short of mass murder. These bombs would have killed everybody in sight and everybody inside those barracks it would have killed everyone. This would have been a historic bloodbath. And it's a hard thing to realize that she went from, you know, stealing some art at her parents' home to going to commit a major bombing and to kill all the police and anybody else in the barracks that she could. So though the police uh, um, portray themselves as amused, they are far from it. They understand that this was a, a deadly attack. And they know it's Rose because they, they, they trace back to the hotel room she stayed in when she met with the pilot. The pilot was unharmed. And um, they put up this poster. And you can see they're upset by the way they take some shots of her in this wanted poster. Put a very unflattering photo. They call, they say masculine appearance that her uh, complexion is sallow and she has a dirty and untidy appearance. Um, those things weren't necessarily untrue, but you can see that they're, they're taking liberties with trying to be harsh. So special branch is deeply involved in trying to find this woman who, um, who tried to kill all of these police officers with her, with her boyfriend, Eddie Gallagher. Rose is traveling the Irish countryside and staying in safe houses from Rep uh, Republican safe houses and she's a mystery because not everybody's warm to her. You know, the people in Northern Ireland are living this, are living these troubles every day. And they're seeing their friends and family die. And they're seeing their sons go off to fight and, and maybe disappear. Um, and they wonder, is this aristocrat just mucking about with them? Is she just having fun? 
Is this just a phase she's going through because this is their lives and it's not a joke. But she is allowed to hide out in these, these houses and the police are not able to find her. She's wearing a disguise and for her a disguise is dressing very feminine. So she's wearing skirts and, and uh, heels, which she finds incredibly uncomfortable. While this is going on, there's another major news story related to the troubles that is uh, making its way across the front pages of papers, just like Rose is. These two young women, on the left is Marion and on the right is Dolores Price. And these two uh, young women, I offer a pop psychologist um, opinion, are what Rose wanted to be. They were born into an IRA family in Northern Ireland. Their father was a soldier in the IRA in the 20s. And they would say that while other kids were hearing nursery rhymes and such, their father would be telling them, you know, my mate Eddie was hanged last week, that sort of thing. It was IRA through and through. Their aunt who lived with them on, on the second floor had lost her hands and her eyes um, uh, helping with the, an IRA bombing. The family was IRA through and through. Dolores uh, was 20 and her sister was barely 18 and they joined the IRA. But though there was a women's branch of the IRA where they would, you know, assist in logistics. Rose wanted to be a soldier, both of them did, and they insisted on being soldiers and they were sworn in as IRA soldiers. At this time, all of these bombings are happening, happening in Northern Ireland and they're not getting any traction, so the IRA decides it's time to bring the bombings off of the newspapers in London to people's front doorsteps. And Rose is the first officer commanding for the IRA and she leads her sister and four men to London with bombs and they pull off four car bombings in the city. And what's interesting is that they target all government buildings. Not unlike the bombing we saw on Christmas with, um, in Nashville, they gave a heads up, they gave a warning um, that wasn't heated, trying to get the civilians out of the way. And these bombs exploded and the biggest one exploded in front of the Old Bailey, the famous courthouse. And um, what I find really uh, fascinating I'm going to admit this person, excuse me, okay. What I find fascinating is nobody died in this major bombing, but imagine the marathon bombing with no deaths. So you have all of these massive casualties and people are maimed and seriously injured, and it's a horrific scene all around. Nobody died from the bombing, but um, obviously with four bombs going off, including one in front of New Scotland Yard and one in an army recruiting office, the authorities are looking for the culprits. Fortunately for the special branch, they already had an informant who told them who did it. So when, when Dolores and her sister tried to flee and went to the airport to fly home while, they, uh, you know, while the bombing was happening, they were intercepted by the police and jailed. Again, the wheels of justice moved quickly back then and they were tried and convicted along with their compatriots and they were sentenced to life in prison. And, uh, they were imprisoned as criminals, which was unacceptable to these IRA members. Traditionally, they would be viewed as um, uh, prisoners of war, which would give them special privileges, such as wearing street clothes in the jail and being able to associate with each other, unlike common criminals. Um, and the sisters especially believed they should be imprisoned at home in Northern Ireland, in a British jail in Northern Ireland, so that families could visit and such. British authorities said no to all of those demands. So the sisters and their, their friends did what was common in the 70s. They went on a hunger strike. Now, this was front page news, just like Rose was. And this was perhaps even a bigger story because it, in the 73, 74, um, you know, even now, uh, you look at these, these two young women, um, they're attractive young women who are terrorists in the views of the British heroes in the, in, the, in the view of the Irish Republicans. And they're going on hunger strike and it's just great fodder for the media. They're very sick, of course, and they're dying. They, they, they are very strict in their hunger strike and the government has to decide what to do and they can't just give in to their demands. I mean, again, imagine Sarnayev saying, well, I'm gonna go on hunger strike unless you move me to a prison wherever I want. So the government decides they're gonna force feed these two young women and their friends. And you'll read in the book, force feeding 
um, something you take for granted when you hear it. It doesn't sound pleasant, but you can't imagine how brutal it is. And it's worse than the hunger strike. And the sisters are deteriorating in health. They're getting sicker by the day. The force feeding methods are giving them infections in their throats and stomachs. And it's a major story about what will the British government do with the Price sisters. Around this time, there's a, a house museum, a beautiful, brilliant, exorbitantly appointed house museum in London, called, in Hampstead Heath, called uh, the Kenwood House. And it's this beautiful home that was once owned by the Guinness family, the family that started the brewery. Um, and it's populated with museum quality art. It's a museum now. It's absolutely gorgeous. And one evening in February of 74, while the museum is closed, the guards hear some commotion and uh, one of them runs to from where the sound is coming from and he finds that someone smashed open the, the grate covering a window, went in the room, took this painting and left, left behind very valuable art, including Rembrandt's. Um, goes out the window, uh, make their way through Hampstead Heath. Hampstead Heath at the time at night would be popular. witness to anything that they saw. The police were chained into the house um, and uh, uh, the thieves cut the, they cut the uh, phone lines. I just got a little message that my internet connection was unstable. Um, if I go offline, I'll, I'll come back quickly. So nobody knows who stole this painting. This is called The Guitar Player by Vermeer. Incredibly valuable. All Vermeer paintings are incredibly valuable. There are only 36 known works. In the 70s, people didn't know how many there were, were there 30 or were there 40. Um, but this is all they took, and it's worth millions of dollars. And the police have no clues. But finally, they get, they get a bunch of letters that don't lead them anywhere. But finally, they get a letter from a group saying they have the painting, and it will be returned in exchange for moving the Price Sisters back to Northern Ireland. And to prove their bona fides, they follow that up with another letter to the press that includes a swatch of the canvas from this painting, not from the face of it, but from the side. So the painting's in damage. But now we know that these people who are demanding that the Price Sisters be sent home to serve their sentence are the real holders of this painting, which is in the custody of the government. So the government is heavily vested in getting this back. A few weeks later, uh, the servant's door and the rear of this building, the bu I'm sorry, the uh, buzzer is, is um, rung. And this is the longest building in all of Ireland. It's just this amazing mansion called the Rustborough House. And the Rustborough House is owned and occupied by um, the Bite family, Sir Alfred and his wife, Lady Clementine Bite. And they're diamond uh, heirs. They're as wealthy as wealthy can be. If Rose was the 1%, they were the 0.1%. And this is another place that's essentially a museum with the art collection they have. All of the world's great artists are, are featured in here. And um, so the buzzer rings at the em employee entrance in the rear, and one of the servant's children answers the door. He's a 14-year-old boy, and he opens the door, and there's a woman with a French accent who says, um, my car, in broken English, my car has broken down. He can see the car. Uh, can you let me use the phone? And the kid opens the door, and when he opens the door, two men with machine guns barge in with the woman, and they get the entire staff, and they lock them up. They're very gentle with the staff, but then they make their way to the drawing room where they find Sir Alfred and Lady Clementine, and they're listening to the phonograph. And this group of thugs go in, and they strike Sir Alfred in the head. They tie him up on the, put him on the floor. They tie up his wife, and they drag her to the basement, kicking and screaming. They throw her on the dirt floor. Um, and they, they, um, they call them capitalist pigs over and over. Interestingly, uh, they go back. And when they're done tying up all these people and subduing them, the woman takes charge. And she no longer has a French accent. She has a British accent because it's Rose Dugdale. And Rose directs these men, these brutish men, around the house, stealing 19 paintings. And 
I know who the men were and I reveal who they were in the book. What's amazing is these men would have no idea what paintings to take. They wouldn't know, uh, they wouldn't know Vermeer, which they took from any other work. And Rose pointed out three Rubens, a Goya, uh, Van Dyck, um, Vermeer and others. It's the biggest art theft in history to that point. And it's perpetrated and mastermind and directed by a woman. And that is unprecedented to that day. And it still hasn't happened to our day. So for better or worse, Rose Dugdale is the woman who has pulled off the biggest heist in history. This is the Vermeer they stole. And it's called Lady Writing a Letter with Her Maid. And like all Vermeers, you can study it for hours and and come up with more questions and no answers. And all of the questions are, are puzzles for you to try to figure out. Um, interestingly, this painting has a 300 year old connection to the other Vermeer that I just showed you that I explain in the book. And if you love art and if you love Vermeer, you'll be fascinated by the connection between these two paintings. But they're reunited 300 years later um, in theft. So these 19 paintings are gone the Garda arrives, they free the Bite family, and they find these empty frames, and art thieves usually leave the frames behind only because frames are heavy, but paintings are not. Paintings on stretchers are pretty light. So to make them less cumbersome, they left these frames behind. Horrible scene for, for, for someone like me to see, believe me. Um, and it takes the police by, uh, takes the police aback. The police detectives who arrive were surprised to know that there were millions of dollars worth of art in Ireland. They had no idea. You know, this was a new thing for them. So they're on the hunt for these paintings. And they do have a lead. And that lead, because of the description of the woman, makes them think this could be Rose Dugdale, especially because the Kenwood house had just been robbed with an IRA motive. Not long after the paintings are taken, immediately, in fact, the authorities get word that the people who stole the paintings will return them if the Price sisters are sent back to Northern Ireland, exactly like the people who stole the paintings at the Kenwood house. And in the book, in the epilogue, and I can, as I'm telling you this, I can remember writing the epilogue at your, at your library. Um, I make the case, a circumstantial case, but convincing that Rose Dugdale not only stole this Vermeer, but she stole the previous one, the guitar player, which is just an astounding thing in the annals of art crime. Now, I mentioned earlier with the theft at her parents' home, she, was, uh, she had good ideas in terms of heist, but she wasn't a great criminal. So they got the paintings, but part of her plan was to go to this cottage that she rented as a French woman out in the middle of nowhere in Ireland in County Cork, and um, thinking no one, you know, that'd be a great place to hide out, not realizing that in Ireland, if you're an outsider, you're noticed. And the authorities were onto her rather quickly and they found her at this cottage and they arrested her and recovered all 19 paintings. They're in the, the boot of her car. And what I, f I find bittersweet is that the three men that accompanied her in this heist were not there and they were never caught or, or prosecuted. But Rose was there and I always wonder why she stayed behind why she was willing to, to be the one at that place when the other men fled. And part of me will always believe that part of her wanted to go to prison. It was sort of a rite of passage for her to become a hardcore uh, revolutionary. So Rose goes to prison and in true Rose Dugdale fashion, because nothing she does can be ordinary, she immediately starts to feel a little funny inside and she sneaks a jar of her urine to her attorney who tells her, you're pregnant, Rose. Um, she became pregnant almost immediately upon arriving in Ireland um, after leaving Walter. And while in prison, she gave birth to a son named Rory. And he's a cute, he's a cute little guy, I think you would all agree. And um, it's the first child ever born in an Irish prison. Again, she created these problems for the authorities. They, they didn't know what to do. Should they let her free or let her go to a hospital? And they, they, she gave birth, they set up a hospital unit in the prison so she could give birth. The most bittersweet part though is this, is that when Rose took these paintings to try to get Dolores Price back, 
Dolores Price sent a message back via the media, to, to, through her father via the media. And that message was that she loves art and she hopes that people will just give the paintings back because Dolores was the real deal. And neither she nor her sister had any intention to be moved as a ransom. If they were gonna be moved back to Northern Ireland as they insisted, then they would do so based on principle and their own actions, not on uh, because someone stole their paintings. Uh, someone's paintings, and you, it gives you an indication of the types of women we're, we're talking about here. Now, I can't give away the whole book. That's far from the end of Rose's story, and her husband, her, her boyfriend, Eddie Gallagher, knows that his, the mother of his child is in prison, and he decides he needs to do something about it, and I hope that you will pick up the woman who stole Vermeer and read the fascinating rest of Rose's story, which is you will, you will find it hard to believe. At the very end of her life in modern day, Rose is finally accepted by the IRA. Uh, she becomes uh, one of the leaders of the Sinn Féin education movement. And it's a real contrast because Dolores is set free from prison. She suffers from PTSD and abuses uh, drugs and alcohol for much of her life. She marries the movie star Stephen Ray, who played an IRA member in The Crying Game. Um, and then when the Good Friday Accords happen, Dolores and Marion are very much against them. She's, they're against the peace accords. They didn't believe in the compromise that Jerry Adams and the rest made. And as a result, Rose gave interviews to a documentarian. I'm sorry, Dolores did on the condition they would never be released until she had died. And then tragically, at a young age of 63, Dolores died from her substance abuse, it is believed. She went to her grave hating Jerry Adams and what had become of the movement. Whereas Rose, who could never become an IRA member, was later accepted. And you see her here at a parade in Ireland with Jerry Adams. So the intersection between these two women, um, uh, it's just an amazing way. There's no parallel, it's just the way that they, the paradox between their two lives. So that's the, that's an overview of the book. It's uh, I think, and I hope that you'll read it. And I think that when you do, you'll find um, uh, what I gave you is just the tip of the iceberg. I think you will be amazed to read about this woman's life and what she did and just how uh, important a character she is in women's history and women's liberation, uh, although you probably have never heard of her. Um, my hope is that because of this book, many people will. And um, here in the United States, <clears throat> she will be uh, better known uh, like she is in Dublin. And I will tell you that when I'm interviewed by the Irish about this book, they always say, you rather like Rose Dugdale, don't you? And the truth is, it's not a matter of liking her. I, I just do respect the fact that she was true to her beliefs. I loathe the things she did. You know, stealing paintings and attempted murder are nothing to, to sniff at. Uh, terrorism and art theft are where my life intersects with Rose. So I think what she did was an abomination but I have a grudging respect for a, a person who is a true believer from birth through her 80s. And um, uh, that's her story. So with that, I thank you so much for sharing some of your night with me. I hope you pick up the book. It's available on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and of course, hopefully at the library um, and at your local brick and mortar bookstore. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. I think um, before long, you'll see it. Uh, I'll whisper to you that you'll see it on the screen before um, all is said and done. And with that, if you have any questions about Rose or anything else, I'm happy to field them, but thank you for, for your time. If anyone wants to jump in with a question, feel free to unmute yourself. Okay, I have a question. Um, I got very interested in the child, I, maybe because, you know, being a mother. Um, what happened to the little boy? He was... Um, I hate to give away too much of the story, but I will tell you this, that he's a really nice guy. He's perfectly normal and well-adjusted. He's a wonderful person to speak with, and he lived happily ever after. But there's a good story about what happens to him in between. 
I think you'll enjoy. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else have any questions? Where is she living right now? She's living in Dublin. Oh. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't live high on the hog. You know, she, her parents never abandoned her. And even when her father died, he didn't, he gave her the same inheritance that he gave his other children, um, despite all that she put them through. I mean, you know, you have to imagine these aristocrats, they raised her daughter like they raised her other kids, but at the end of the day, she had her poor parents on the front pages of newspapers around the world. And um, I think if you get the book, you'll, see, you'll read about the parents and I think you'll find them fascinating people as well. One thing I am very impressed with is the research that went into this. It was obvious that you spent, I don't know, years, did, how, how long did it take you for this? Altogether, the book took three years, um, but I had known about her for a long time. Um, I would say, what's, thank you for that, first of all, Myrna. I would say that, um, oh, you'll, you'll see at the very end of the book, I was very close to interviewing Rose for the book. And at the last second, she was unable to participate because of what happened with Dolores Price and giving interviews and then dying and the interviews becoming public and people getting arrested from these interviews. So her compatriots in Sinn Féin didn't want her to be interviewed. So the book is 270 pages, but it's got 600 footnotes because I feel, you know, if you're going to write somebody's life story, you need to be precise. And I'll tell you one aside, I, I'm thankful, very thankful that the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the Washington Post gave it rave reviews. The only critique was from the Washington Post and said that it, and I don't understand this, frankly, that it had, um, was a little, a, a little too much detail. And I felt like I'm an investigator by trade and you have to have a lot of detail. Um, I'll take that, I'll take that as a little hit. Um, because I feel like I owe it to Rose Dugdale to be as precise as possible. And when Walter got the book, Walter Heaton, he's active on social media at 94. And um, I was really worried. I was just thinking, he's so vocal. He's such a revolutionary. When he reads this book, if he doesn't like it, I'm going to be toast. And he <laughs> read it and wrote to me and loves it. He says the best book he's read and you nailed it 100%. I was like, as many of you know, because you probably attend a lot of book talks, you don't make money writing books, right? You make a little bit of money, but it's minimum wage when you think about the time you put into it. But to hear a guy at 94 tell you you wrote you you were precise in writing his you know, part of his life story, it, the reward is really rich because you feel like, well, you know, when you write a book, it's around forever, and um, it's something that you can stand by. So um, I'm proud of that fact. When did you publish this? The book came out in um, November, on November 10th, and we've had an enormous amount of struggle. Um, the, frankly, the publisher didn't anticipate the demand, um, and they, the book sold out on Amazon the morning of its release. So it's, re it's really hard to find, and I hate directing people to Amazon or, or Bonds yeah. & Noble. I really do, but um, that's where the easiest place to get it right now. Well, I write a column for the, it used to be the Danvers Herald, now it's the Herald Citizen, but um, it's every other week, and I'm talking about this book and you. For this oh, great. Conference. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Martin. I appreciate that. that. But I'm fascinated. I, I, you can tell that you put a lot of yourself into it, and that shows, and I think the person who criticized you for that is, is really not too bright. Well, thank you, and I will say, I, I did, you know, Anytime you write a review, you have to say one little dig. You can't write a, a, a review that's great one to 100. You know, I always, anytime you get criticisms on your work anyway, I remember, boy, George, you read uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln were pilloried throughout their lives. I'll take it. It's okay. Thank you, though. Does your name mean anything? I mean, it sounds like love, Anthony Love. For yeah, more it's a, it's a, uh, is that's a legitimate name of your <laughs> yes <laughs> well i think it adds a certain flair no, to I, you right no, if, if i made that name up i'd be a romance novelist murder that's my real name 
but it intrigued me from the beginning. So <laughs> I'm sure other women will you know, connect with that as well. I wish you luck. Anybody, anybody else? You've done a great job. I'm, I, for one, will manage to read this because uh, oh, you left enough out, so I've been too intrigued. Um, someone asked if um, you did an audio version of the book. Interesting question. So that's forthcoming. I, um, I have to tell you, when I was writing this, and um, you know, I'm looking at the audience names, and it's mostly women. Uh, yeah. When I was writing the book, especially with the current climate, I became worried because it's such a feminist tale that I would be criticized for a man telling it. Mm. And so halfway through it, I stopped and I, I spoke to, you know, I work on the Fenway at the Gardner, so I was able to mm. speak to um, professors who, who, female professors who teach women's studies and um, gender studies. And when I was a, a literature student, when I was a young man, I studied women's lit. So they told me, no, 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 as long as you're, you know, as long as you tell the story respectfully, you should be okay. So that's what I tried to do. But I've always been very conscious of the fact I'm telling a woman's story. So rather than record the book myself, I asked that a female narrator with a British accent, so someone like Rose, read the book. So that's what the, a little bit of a holdup is. If I did it myself, it'd be out by now. But I feel like a woman's story, even though it's not written by a woman, it'll sound better told by a woman. I, I Hopefully I'm right, but I, I get to hear the woman's reading style and it's beautiful. So it's uh, forthcoming. You can pre-order, I believe now, I'm not sure. Is it gonna be on Audible? It better be, Jules. <laughs> How's the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum going? Well, we're closed right now. Oh, so it's tragic. It. It's been. I, I went to girls' Latin school for six years, from seventh grade through the you know through graduation, and we were part of it used to be Boston Teachers College, and we were the annex of it. Good and story, yeah. First thing they did was to make us walk over to the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum and be introduced to it, and we came became really enamored of it. It so. I feel like that was my first museum connection. Well, you know, the Gardner Museum has a North Shore connection because um, Mrs. Gardner had a place up uh, on the North Shore. Yes. And um, just on January 3rd, I think, uh, someone who's really important to me, her, her great nephew, Jack Gardner, who's named for her son, who passed away at the age of two, mm. uh, John, uh, John Gardner, passed away. He was 97 years old. He was the last family member to have encountered Isabella. So the story is that she had a car take her to his house so he could sit on her lap. Um, and he passed away at 97. And it's, I, I said to some friends today, it's, um, it's, it's, it sounds strange saying that a 97 year old person passed uh, too soon, but it's, it's too soon. He's like the last living connection to Isabella. So um, uh, it's a sad loss for the Gardner community. It certainly is. She, <laughs> she was a very different woman, though. You ought to do a story on her. Oh, there are plenty. And there's another one in the works. Is there? Yep. Not by me. Not by me. I write different sorts of stuff, but she, there's a the woman who wrote the biography of uh, Clover Adams is working on the biography of Isabella. That'll be, that'll be amazing. And she's doing it with the cooperation of the museum too. So Don't she has access to everything. Don't they have a John <clears throat> Singer Sargent picture of painting of uh, Isabella? Say that again? Don't they have a, a painting done by uh, John, this, you know, Sargent, Singer Sargent um, of Isabella Stewart Gardner? Oh yes, yeah, that's the key. That's the, the big it wasn't important stolen. portrait. Yep. That was not stolen. That's still oh, the God, no, 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 no. You don't mess you don't mess with Mrs. Gardner that much. <laughs> well, it's a very interesting connection though. She was uh, the what what the Dion of the whole era. I mean, she was wasn't she the leader and everybody followed her? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, she was uh, a woman way ahead of her time, not unlike Rose. She was, um, the way she conducted herself and the way she acted and uh, was um, admirable. But at the time, you know, it, the famous thing is women hated her and men loved her. And, um, <laughs> That's all I care about, what you missed. 
I said, that's all she cared about, wasn't it? She as the, the man who loved her. No, she cared about being her own person. I think she cared about, I'm Isabella Stuart Gardner. Um, I've had these hardships in my life. I'm going to, you know, with her child, mm -hmm. I'm going to be me. Uh, there's nothing better. She was fully herself. And she, people thought she was crazy building this museum. Mm. And when the museum opened on June, uh, New Year's Day in 1903, people came in and she served them champagne and donuts because she, she said she had spent all the money on the art. And um, everything about her is legendary. Um, I'm so lucky to have been associated with the place. I'm so lucky that my daughters, from when they were little girls, mm. now they're women, have this really strong connection to this role model. Um, and I hope in some weird way, they take some lessons from Rose Dugdale too, in that they lead the men around and the men don't lead them around. I think the first thing that caught my eye as a child going in there was, it, you felt like you were in an Italianate home in some place in Italy that was so magnificent. That took imagination for her to bring over all that stuff and have it recreated back here. No one else has ever done it. No one else could afford it. Well, I mean, the MFA is bigger and probably costs more, but nobody else had the, 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 um, vision. the vision to say, well, I don't want, I don't want columns made by contractors in the United States. I want real relics, you know, and I don't care if we're building this on a swamp, we're building it. <laughs> and uh, the place is really resilient. So the palace is in perfect shape. There's nothing to worry about. Um, I think it leaks less than the new building does. So, uh, so you brought back some fond memories of the Il Isabella Stewart Guard regime for me. It awesome. was, it was, it, that's a wonderful word for that though. It is, it always will be awesome. And the, uh, and the further away we get in centuries, I think it'll be even more appreciated. Completely timeless. Yep, it'll never change and it'll always be loved. Well, thank you for all the effort you put into this. This is amazing. Oh, my pleasure. So, I'm thrilled that, that Danvers was hospitable to you, but I would, I would. Well, I, lived in, I was a Swampskit uh, resident uh, at the time. I used to live in Swampskit, so Danvers was nice and um, uh, convenient. You know <laughs> and um, I have to credit my ex-wife. She and I are friendly and we would go on Saturdays and work together there and, um, uh, I, you know, you never forget where you wrote your book. So uh, thank you to the hus uh, hospitality uh, of the people at the uh, Peabody. And thank you. Um, Anthony, can, do you have an idea what your next subject will be? And also, can you let us know when you'll be at the Danvers Library again so we can try to trick you into giving us some information about the Gardner investigation? <laughs> <laughs> I can never be tricked, Barb. I never... <laughs> I can tell you that there's a documentary coming out on Netflix. I don't know when. Oh, oh. And um, I can tell you that in my years of working on this case, that one of the great things I've learned is that documentaries are garbage. I hate documentaries. I never watch them. They are, they are, when documentaries are made, they're made with an agenda. So the people who create them, when they sell the project, they have their answer. All right, so this documentary on Netflix will not include me. I refuse to participate. And it won't include my partner in the FBI. So you have to wonder, how do you make a documentary oh. without us? But um, so we have to keep it secret. Um, uh, the next book, I'm struggling right now because I have a few topics that I'm interested in. I've encountered another woman who's not unlike Rose, who was a suffragette in um, Great Britain. And she's fascinating to me and she, she went to a museum and destroyed, uh, tried to destroy a painting. I always have, like to have a little art connection. Yeah. And um, I'm thinking about writing about her. It's just, you know, can I get the primary documents because everybody involved is dead. So, um, have, you uh, ever, I, I, have you ever visited Glen Magna? Have I visited what? I'm sorry. Glen Magna in Danvers. No. That's put that on your list. Okay. No, if we sorry. can ever get out again, I certainly will. Do a story there. Barb, do you have a, a specific question you want to ask about the Godner, though? I feel bad uh, not, not helping you out. Oh, no, no. All said, I just, I wondered what your next project would be, because I did read Stealing Rembrandts, and I was at your last um, talk at the library. Oh, thank you. So 
I'm just fascinated by the gardener theft and um, I mean, there's nothing like that really. No, there isn't. And it's torture. And I can tell you that, um, oh, you went on mute. Um, the, there is nothing like the Godner theft in terms of its enormity, but there's nothing like it in terms of investigations either. Um, that I have this one partner from the FBI. We've been at it every day together. And we just, uh, no cases like this in that, no, we never get a break. You know, we got one or two, but like, we have a friend who also uh, in the FBI who recovered a, a Norman Rockwell a few years ago, right? It was a big deal and he was on TV with the painting, but here's how he recovered it. The guy who had it, his lawyer called the FBI and said, we want to get his painting back. You know, for us, every single little thing we've learned has been through blood, sweat and tears, literally. It's just, we just can't catch a break. And yeah. um, I just remember this, that uh, don't believe documentaries. And also, the other thing to remember is when you're looking for stolen paintings, they're not like Whitey Bulger. They don't have to go to CBS. <laughs> they just sit where you leave yeah. them. Um, so it's, it's much harder. Um, but I'm going to tell you, Barb, uh, we are going to get these darn paintings back one day. Yeah. And I will never stop looking for them. If you hear five years from now that Anthony Mori left the Gardner Museum and he's working for Charlie Baker or something, know that behind the scenes, I'm still looking for the paintings because I can't quit them now. That'd be yeah, easy. yeah. I'm just praying because it's such a loss. I mean, it's the the number of them, the, the fact that they can barely put a value on them because they're just so extraordinary. It's um, it's heartbreaking actually when you think about it. But I hope they're still out there because they are. They are. Yeah. I saw, I saw Maureen O'Rourke ask that question. Yes, they're definitely still out there, Maureen. We will get them, I guarantee it. And if I don't, I will die trying, I give you my word. I will never stop looking for the paintings, ever. Is there a certain mindset to thieves who steal art? I mean, is, do they fit some composite, you know? Ooh, is, right oh. you, have to, you have to read a book that Bob read called Stealing Rembrandts. The entire book is about that topic. Really? That's the book. Yep, get that book, Myrna. I read it. <laughs> Yeah. Not that I'm planning any heist at all, but I don't <laughs> know what goes on in somebody's mind. That it just in a nutshell, they're all just common criminals. They're not, um, they're they, not these, they're not, I hate the idea of a gentleman thief. They don't exist. That's a movie. That's a movie thing. But check out Stealing Rembrandt's Murder. I think the library has it. And you know, um, they well, do. I'll and, look for all your things, even though you don't pronounce it a moray, I'm going to. I do. I pronounce it amore. You, you add the e, the steam. Oh my God! Yeah, my father would roll over in his grave if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Was it shortened from something, or was that always it? Oh no! You really have it. You really find my name to be a puzzle. No, I it's amore. Like interesting. I'll tell you guys something. This is awful. It's like I hope I say this without saying anything risque, but. Um, I always thought, you know, my last name is Amari, just me. Hey, maybe that meant like way back when my family was known to be like a loving family. Well, I did some research and one, one thing I learned was that the, the name was ascribed to people who um, uh, allegedly were famous for infidelity or, or visiting prostitutes. And I, I said, well, maybe the name isn't as proud as I had hoped it, it, it was. <laughs> I refuse to believe that version of the story. That spoils it for me. I'm just going to no, say- No, that's not true. I broke the trend. I, I thought you trend. were going to say it meant that you found out that someone in your family was a great lover. I didn't think you were going to say it was someone who went to- That's the process. story I'm going with, though, Julie. Yeah, you should that's go right. with that one. <laughs> yeah. It's actually a pretty name, though. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Another question in the chat, um, Nancy, I think she's left, but she asked, um, was Rose the first terrorist to steal art supporting terrorism? That I know of, yes. So that's another mm -hmm. thing that makes her unusual. And the entire introduction to the book talks about this, in that the cause, when people steal art, 99.9% .9 of the time is to try to monetize the paintings. So Rose is unique in that respect, too, mm -hmm. that she stole them for a cause. Um, and maybe I'm showing a little bias here. I just hate to think of, I, I don't like to think of the Irish Republicans as terrorists. Um, I think I, I 
my bias is that they were fighting for freedom. Mm. But I don't show it in the book. Well, we thank you again. I, I'm just very impressed and I'm glad. You're my third Zoom thing today. And I <laughs> oh that out. I, I, so I said, now I'm going to go through this. So I'm delighted that I did. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everybody, for, for joining in. And keep the faith, despite what you see in the news. Things will get better. <sighs> thank you. So this, was really, this was really great talk. Yeah, it was really nice. Thank you. And thank you, Thanks everybody, so much, for coming. Everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.